Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us again today. Um, I want to start, as I always do, with a statistical update on COVID-19 in Scotland. As at nine o'clock this morning, I can report that there have been uh, 14,260 positive cases confirmed, which is an increase of 143 since yesterday. A total of 1,449 patients are in hospital with the virus. Uh, 1,066 of them have been confirmed through a test as having COVID-19 and 383 are suspected of having the virus. And that uh, overall number represents a decrease of 31 since yesterday. A total of 71 people last night were in intensive care with confirmed or suspected COVID-19, which is no change since the figure I reported to you here yesterday. I'm also able to confirm that since the 5th of March, a total of 3,290 patients who had tested positive and uh, required hospitalisation for the virus have now been able to leave hospital, which is uh, good news for them and their families. Unfortunately, I also have to report that in the past 24 hours, 46 deaths have been registered of patients who had been confirmed through a test as having the virus, and that takes the total number of deaths in Scotland under that measurement uh, to 2,053. As always, because it's so uh, important every single day that we uh, never see these numbers as statistics, uh, as always, I want to stress that point. Uh, behind every single one of these statistics I read out to you here today is an individual whose loss is being mourned by their friends, their family uh, and all of their loved ones. And I want to send again today my deepest condolences to everyone who has lost a loved one to this virus. The thoughts of me, the government and I'm sure everybody across Scotland are very much with you at this time. I also want to thank, uh, again as I always do, our health and care workers. Once again, last night I joined with people across the country in the applause at 8pm. That is a small uh, but I hope powerful way of demonstrating our deep appreciation, our ongoing appreciation for your incredible efforts at this very, very challenging time. There are, of course, many, many other people who in various different ways are keeping the country going during this crisis. I can't list all of them every day, but if you are in any of these categories, know that my uh, deep appreciation and gratitude is with all of you. But from time to time, uh, I want to single out particular groups of workers so that uh, they know that their efforts are not forgotten at this time. Um, and today I'm going to highlight the role of our telecoms workers and especially telecoms engineers. Because, you know, the fact that we are being forced, as, as we are just now, to stay physically distant from each other has made many of us rely more than ever on technology. We're reliant uh, much more now on technology for access to public services. Our children are relying on uh, technology for access to education. Uh, many uh, are working from home and so need technology for that. And of course, we're all using technology to stay in touch with our friends and family at a time when we cannot physically see them. So the contribution of those who keep all of these systems working, our phone and our broadband networks uh, going at this time are so important uh, to our everyday lives. That's true at all times, but it is particularly true right now. So I wanted to take the opportunity to, today to say thank you to all of you. I'm going to keep my uh, general update today at relatively brief. Um, as you know, the lockdown restrictions here in Scotland remain very much in place. Uh, the message to you today over the weekend and into next week is still stay at home. Uh, the only change we've made uh, to the, the guidance in place, uh, which of course we announced last weekend, is the change on exercise. Um, and the position we have in Scotland now, I want to be very clear, continues to be based on our assessment of the evidence and on what we judge is right for the protection of people across the country. However, as I also said on Sunday, we will continue to monitor the evidence very closely on an ongoing basis. And as we hopefully see more evidence of a downward trend in the virus, we will then consider further changes, but we will do so on a very careful and gradual basis. When we know that lives are at stake, and we have uh, learned that every day over these past seven or eight weeks as I've stood up here day in and day out and, and read out numbers of people who have died, uh, we do know that lives are at stake with this virus. 
then for as long as that continues to be the case, I am going to continue to err on the side of caution, err on the side of saving lives uh, and reducing the number of people who might die unnecessarily. And I hope I have your continued understanding in doing that. However, I also want to give you as much visibility and advance notice of future changes as possible. We can't live like this forever, so we need to get some normality back as we continue to suppress the virus. Uh, so we'll try to set out, as we have done in recent weeks, on an ongoing basis as much of our thinking and consideration as we can. So even where we can't yet give firm dates of when things will open up again, at least we will seek to share with you the order of priority and potential phasing. So I'll give you an indication now that next week I will share with you more information on the assessments we're making and the range of options that we're now looking at and also any further minor changes that we might make in the short term. And as I've said before, as we make these decisions, fairness and quality of life will be really important factors. Uh, we are, of course, keen to get the economy moving again. I am very keen to get the economy moving again. That matters to all of us. It doesn't just matter to businesses. But we also have to consider very carefully our social interactions. You know, a life where we go to work but stay locked down with no family interaction for the rest of the time is not one that many of us, if any of us, would enjoy. So given that we're likely to have, for quite a while to come, very limited room for manoeuvre, and I want to stress that that is the case, we will need to get these balances as right as possible. And that's why we're paying close attention to the ideas that many of you are taking the time to share with us. Our considerations will be informed, as we've always said, by the scientific evidence and advice and the clear principles that we've set out. And in all of this, continuing to set out clearly to you why we are asking you to live your lives in such a restrictive way is vital so that you understand that we are not asking you to do this for no reason and will not ask you to do so for any longer than we judge to be necessary. It's not enough and, and never will be enough, in my view, for me simply to tell you what I want you to do. I have to explain, I've got a duty to explain to you on an ongoing basis my reasons for that. Compliance with any measures we may need to keep in place will, I think, always be higher if I am clear, rational and straight with you about the difficult judgment that these are based on. So on that theme, I thought I'd just very briefly share with you today the results of some polling on attitudes that we have undertaken. And you'll understand that we do this just to check that the messages that we are trying to convey are being understood and getting uh, across. Uh, and though I'm not complacent about this at all, this polling that I'm going to share with you suggests that that really important bond of understanding between government and you, the public, in Scotland right now is currently very strong. And I want to do everything I can to keep it that way. The polling reveals that there's widespread endorsement for the approach that we are taking in Scotland. Uh, so, for example, 84% of you agree with a slow and gradual uh, lifting of restrictions. 82% uh, of you uh, agree that before significant changes, uh, before further significant changes to lockdown restrictions are brought in, the impact of those already introduced should be assessed. And 86% of you continue to agree that decisions on when and how to lift restrictions must be based on saving lives and protecting the NHS. So I want to, to take the opportunity again today to thank you for your support. These last few weeks have truly been a collective endeavour. We've all been making sacrifices, not just for our own sakes, but for the sake of each other as well. We've been putting those values I keep talking about of, of love, kindness and solidarity into practice. And my ask of you is that we keep doing so for a bit longer. Uh, and let me therefore end with this fundamental point. The way in which we save lives, but also the way in which we emerge from this lockdown that bit more quickly is by sticking now with the current guidance. So before I hand over firstly to the Chief Nursing Officer and then to our National Clinical Director, I want to reiterate once again at what that guidance says. Please stay at home except for essential work that you can't do at home or for buying food or accessing medicines or for exercising. You should not be going out. 
Uh, of course, you can now exercise more than once a day if you want to, but when you are out, please stay more than two metres from other people and don't meet up with people from other households. Please wear a face covering if you can, if you are in a shop or in public transport, and remember to wash your hands thoroughly and regularly. And finally, if you or someone else in your household has symptoms of the virus, then please stay at home completely. I know that uh, these restrictions are tough. I, I say this every day, but I'm always conscious on a Friday of just how much tougher these restrictions feel for all of us over the weekend, uh, particularly when uh, the sun is out, which, as we know, is sometimes a, a rare occasion in our country. But these restrictions are essential for now. And crucially, and this is the point I really want to leave you with, they are making a difference. And I hope you can see that in the statistics, albeit still difficult statistics, that I am uh, sharing with you every day. By staying at home, we are slowing down the spread of this virus. We are protecting the NHS and we are undoubtedly saving lives. And we're also bringing much closer that day when we can start that return to normality. So thank you very much for doing the right thing. Uh, thank you for the sacrifices you are making. Please keep doing it for your own sake and your family's sake, but for the sake of everybody across the country. Uh, thank you very much uh, indeed for listening. I'm going to hand over now to Fiona McQueen, our Chief Nursing Officer, uh, and then to Professor uh, Leach, our National Clinical Director. First Fiona. Minister, thank you. And the First Minister has talked about the, the challenging times that we've all been living through and also about how we might look forward to, to, going, to going forwards when we're, we're getting out of this. So today I wanted, as the International uh, Week of the Nurse is has coming to an end, I wanted to, to pay tribute again to my nursing colleagues, but also to highlight some of the work that's perhaps less visible across our health and social care setting that our nurses and our social care workers do. But also to reflect a bit on how all of us can help improve our, our psychological and emotional well-being so that as we move forwards, then we can be in the very best health that we, we possibly can be. I talked on Tuesday, which was International Day of the Nurse, about the wide range of, of areas where nurses work and my deep gratitude to everyone who works in that sector. And most of us, when, when we think of nurses, are, are now looking at nurses in visors and masks and scrubs and doing the amazing life-saving work that they do. But many nurses can only do that because of the work that our nurses within our university settings ha have done and continue to do. And I want to pay tribute and thank them for doing what they're doing. The, uh, through them, we've been able to get uh, around 4,000 additional students out into the workforce that are continuing to support uh, care right across the spectrum of what we were doing. And I know they're also working very hard just now at looking at our intake for September so that we can continue to have an excellent supply of nurses for Scotland in the coming years. The nurses who are prepared across Scotland support people with a learning disability, either in a residential setting or in their own homes. Our social care workers also provide that relentless day in, day out support. We have nurses working in oil rigs, in prisons and custody suites, um, and all across the country, they're often doing that invisibly and silently. But we're all very grateful, and I'm incredibly grateful to all of these nurses across settings in terms of what they do. Our mental health nurses, uh, we've had a number of returners, and I know that some of them have been deployed within our NHS board settings, not to support people with mental health problems, but to support staff who are dealing with COVID and dealing with the intense workload. And that takes me on to our own uh, psychological and emotional well-being, as well as our physical health. The First Minister has talked about being able to go out for exercise for more than once a day. And that's clearly important for us in terms of remaining healthy physically, but also emotionally. In March, she announced almost £4 million investment into mental health so that we could all have improved access to mental health services, investing in our NHS 24 hub, as well as breathing space and other digital uh, methods for us to access services and support so that we can improve our psychological and mental well-being. And then finally this week, there was an announcement of the, the National Wellbeing Hub for Health and Social Care staff, recognising the pressures that uh, everyone is under and making sure that the right support is there for people, whether it's working intensively within our COVID areas, whether it's supporting people through cancer or other uh, life critical diseases, then we want to make sure that our, not just our whole community, but in particular our health and social care staff have access to the right support. 
and I would encourage people to, to take that up. So for me, a big thank you to all our health and social care workers doing whatever they are, but in particular, those who perhaps are less visible to the rest of us in terms of doing what they're doing. Thank you. Thank you. I want to talk today briefly about a subject very close to my heart. Before I did my surgical training and then subsequent public health training, I was a dentist. I was very briefly a high street dentist. And today I'd like to talk to you about the dental care and dental teams across Scotland. As you know, and you've probably encountered, many of the dental practices are closed for face-to-face -face consultations. We stopped routine dental care to limit the risk of coronavirus spread to patients, teams and the wider public. That doesn't mean, though, that access to dental care has gone. In fact, quite the opposite. We have new 56 urgent dental care centres in the last six to eight weeks that have happened in every health board in Scotland. If you need urgent dental care, then phone your dental practice and they will be able to offer advice on managing your symptoms. Or if treatment is urgent, then they can refer you to one of those centres. Due to the potential for virus spread, it may be some time before we can provide a full range of care as usual in our dental practices. The Chief Dental Officer, Tom Ferris, is working hard in consultation with the profession and is preparing a phased recovery plan for high street dental practices so they can go back to providing the care you expect them to provide to your local communities. In line with our broad work of learning from across the world and other countries throughout this pandemic in every sector, on the 7th of May, we published a review of the national recommendations for dental recovery in 11 countries for structuring and restarting dental care to help inform our work here in Scotland. That review has been so well received that the WHO have sent it now around the world to the 190 chief dental officers that the WHO is in touch with. I'd like to give a big thank you to all of the dental teams across Scotland from giving advice to patients, from staffing and providing our urgent care, and for those who have redeployed to other areas, call centres, NHS 24, and other parts of our health and social care system in this pandemic. Thank you sincerely for everything you've done. Thank you very much, Jason. And let me echo that uh, thanks to nurses and to dental teams across the country. Uh, let's go now straight to questions. Um, first question today is from Ewan Petrie from STV. Thank you, First Minister. We had confirmation this morning of an eighth death at home farm on Sky. We saw the care inspectorate and NHS Highlands step in yesterday. But there is growing anger locally that action wasn't taken quickly enough. So why has it taken so long for these serious failings to come to light? And would you support an immediate review of how the care sector is managed? Um, look, we have, right from the outset of this epidemic in Scotland, uh, had care homes and the protection of older people in care homes very much at the, the front of our thinking. We have, as we have learned more about this virus, ad adapted uh, that approach and that can be seen in our approach to testing, in uh, our support to make sure that care homes have the PPE uh, that they require and we will continue to do that. There has, I'll hand over to uh, the Chief Nursing Officer in a moment. Uh, today we've published uh, new guidance for the care home sector to underline uh, to them the, the steps that they should be taking across a whole uh, range of these issues and we will continue to take whatever steps we uh, consider are, are necessary given uh, obviously some of the uh, action that is underway particularly in relation to uh, the care home in Sky. I, I will limit what I say specifically specifically um, about that, except to say that the protection um, and the quality of care of older people in care homes is absolutely paramount. Um, as we come out of this uh, crisis period, uh, whether it's uh, around uh, care homes or, or any other aspect of society and the economy, I think we will all want to reflect and think about how we perhaps do things differently in, in the future. And I've said before, uh, this has been for all of us, uh, and I'm not limiting this comment to care homes, but it certainly applies there. Uh, this has, uh, for all of us, been a, an unprecedented and a difficult situation. Uh, and in terms of how we do things in future, what we have learned uh, through this uh, stage will be extremely important. And that is certainly true for care homes as well as, as other areas. Uh, Fiona, do you want to say just a, a little bit more, perhaps, about the guidance and any more that you want to say about the Sky situation? Certainly, First Minister. So I'm confident that NHS Highland have been available for wraparound services to go in and support any of their care homes, but in particular um, 
the, the care home that in, in Skye. And I know that we currently have staff there working and making sure the first and most important thing is that the residents there are safe and have safe and effective care delivered to them. So yesterday, Health Protection Scotland published further guidance on testing within care homes and then today we're publishing the guidelines for care of people in care homes, which will build on and advise the, the care home staff who are working very expertly right across the country in terms of supporting them. Because this is new, as the First Minister said, our care home uh, Staff are used to working um, with health and social care, providing day-to-day -day care to our residents uh, right across the country. They're used to working with outbreaks, with flu and with, with, with winter vomiting. This has been exceptional in terms of the pressure that's been on top of them. So some of the additional guidance that we're expecting NHS boards to, to put in is around the, the additional nursing care that would be required, but also advice on, on staffing and looking at the, the safety and well-being of staff of residents within care homes and we will be having that reported within health boards every day so that there'll be contact every day with the care homes we'll be confident then that any support that's needed will be able to put in immediately to help maintain the safety of our older people thank you can i just round off this question by saying well obviously my, my condolences my deep and sincere condolences are with any family who's lost a loved one in a care home, but also with families uh, who have loved ones in care homes right now. I understand the anxiety uh, right now must be acute. Um, and also I want to thank those who work in our care homes. This is a, an incredibly difficult job at any time, but it is uh, more difficult and more challenging um, and much more uh, stressful uh, now than has been the case previously. And, and my gratitude is, is with all of them. But the assurance I want to give is that government working with our health protection teams, with NHS uh, boards, with local councils, uh, will do everything on an ongoing basis that we can to give that assurance about quality of care uh, for older people in our care homes. Clearly, care home providers are in a very important position. They have uh, the lead responsibility, not just now, but at all times for ensuring the safety of those they care for. But a at a time like this, it is all the more important that we work together collaboratively, and that is exactly what we will continue to do. Uh, Tim Baxter from ITV Border. Thank you, First Minister. I think you might be aware of the campaign by Kaz and Hannah Jack, who live near Annan. Uh, Hannah had a liver transplant some time ago and is shielding at home. She hasn't felt able to go outside for eight weeks. And she wants safe areas to be set aside outside where vulnerable people can exercise at certain times of the day. So I wonder if that's something you're considering, and if so, how soon that might come in. And can I also just ask you whether any further consideration has been given to any regional differences to lockdown across Scotland? On that last part, no. I mean, I said yesterday, I've, I've not ruled it out. That doesn't mean we are yet ruling it in. We continue to look at the evidence and be driven in our decisions about that. I, 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 caution yesterday and I'll do so again uh, just because the, the smaller we go in terms of the, the part of the population we look at the more uncertainty around the data that we have to factor into our considerations but we will continue to be open-minded to anything I've, I've said a few times before and it's worth repeating that the only thing that matters to me right now as First Minister is doing as far as we possibly can all the things we need to do to suppress this virus and reduce the impact it's having as much as possible. And, and so we will consider every reasonable step we can take in order to achieve that objective. In terms of the main part of your question, you know, I have huge sympathy um, for people who are shielding uh, right now, particularly when they are younger people, not exclusively for everybody who's shielding. It's, it's really difficult to be so isolated and so cut off from your normal way of life for such a prolonged period of time is really, really difficult. And uh, I said yesterday, and I want to repeat again today, uh, your needs and your quality of life will be very much at the heart of all of our considerations going forward. I have a, a few emails over the weeks from people in the shielded category who worry understandably that because they are isolating we've forgotten about you and that we're not thinking about your needs as we make decisions about the next phase and I want to be uh, very clear that that's not the case um, so yes we will consider in, in short those kinds of ideas uh, we, we haven't reached any conclusion yet I uh, have a, a session this afternoon with experts looking at at this very issue about how as we move into a next phase uh, we 
continue to protect people in the shielded category because let's not forget they are in what we call the shielded category because they are most at risk uh, from this virus but how we continue to do that while accepting that we have to ensure quality of life and allow people perhaps to make judgments about uh, their own decisions in the future so no decisions have been reached on that yet uh, but we will continue to make sure that the, the the people who are in this category are absolutely not forgotten about as we take these difficult judgments for where we go from here. Uh, David Henderson from BBC Scotland. Thank you, First Minister. The new guidance from Health Protection Scotland on testing and care homes has prompted some concern today because it appears to suggest that when an outbreak is detected at a care home, which is part of a chain, assurances must be sought that the home has a contingency plan before that testing is carried out. Is there not a risk that this could delay testing and expose residents and staff to infection? And if I may also ask, do you have any sense of how the R number, the rate of spread, might vary within Scotland between urban and rural areas? Um, I'll hand over to the Chief Nursing Officer on the point about the guidance, but can I say that speed of uh, action here is, is absolutely vital and nothing we are doing is... Uh, about slowing down that progress. Uh, it's all about making sure that the right actions are taken in the right way that allows us to have the best possible chance of reducing spread. But I'll hand over uh, to Fiona McQueen on that point in a second. On the R number, um, I, don't, I don't know, David, if you were able to attend the briefing that uh, journalists had with the government's chief statistician and, and uh, other experts yesterday who explained a bit more about the how the R number is calculated. Uh, there may well be differences between urban and, and rural, uh, but the... The, the further we go into smaller geographic areas, the, the greater the uncertainty that there is in making those assessments. So we, we continue to look at how we refine uh, our calculations around the R number so that we can base our decisions uh, properly on that. But at the moment, uh, the advice I have is that the, the most reliable way of uh, reporting the R number is in the range we report it and at a Scotland-wide level. But we continue to, uh, as we get more understanding and data about the spread of this virus, look to see how we can further refine that in future. Uh, Fiona. Well, the, the Health Protection Scotland guidance talks about how when testing should happen in care homes when there is a, one person with symptoms, and that then means that others should be uh, residents should be tested as well as staff. I have absolutely no doubt these staff should be tested as soon as practically possible in terms of having the test, and we're working very very hard to make sure that the results come through as quickly as possible. All care homes should have contingency plans, not just for COVID. They should have contingency plans um, if, there, if there is bad weather and their staff can't get in or if they have norovirus or flu. In this case in particular, um, it would take a, a, a while. So at the moment, it would take perhaps 24 or 48 hours to have the test back. Now, remember, these staff who are being tested are not symptomatic. Any member of staff who have symptoms of COVID should be at home and isolating and then being tested uh, through that way. Staff who are not symptomatic, who are at work, who work in a care home, have appropriate PPE, but should be tested as soon as possible. And then when their test is positive, if it is positive, they should not be at work. The contingency arrangement is, is where we expect our care homes to be able to put additional staff in place, but also in terms of looking at the, the guidance that's been published today, every single day care homes are looking at the needs of the residents, people who are ordinarily at end of life, people who have uh, dementia or people who have COVID-19. They need to look at how many staff they need and if they are needing help and support from the local NHS and social care system, they will get that. So I'm confident that staff should be uh, tested as soon as possible, the asymptomatic staff and if they're positive, they should be staying at home. OK, thank you. Uh, Phil McDonald from Global. Thanks very much, First Minister. Just to follow up on the situation at the home farm, um, can I ask how many other private care homes have been inspected in the same way and are there others out there that could face similar action? 
Um, look, we will take whatever action, uh, and the care inspectorate will take whatever action it considers uh, necessary. The care inspectorate is undertaking uh, inspections of care homes uh, at, during uh, this period. I'm not going to uh, say uh, much more about that because the care inspectorate inspections are largely unannounced inspections, uh, so they don't tell the care home they are turning up in order that they see uh, the care home as it is is operating. But that those inspections are underway, and if the care inspectorate thinks in any uh, case that the kind of action that has been taken in uh, Home Farm and Sky is appropriate, then it is for them to, to judge that and to take that action. And we also have Healthcare Improvement Scotland, who are used to uh, in inspecting the, the health care and the health system because the, the COVID-19 is over and above and it's additional to health and social care. So Healthcare Improvement Scotland is supporting infection prevention and control advice, practice development advice, as well as other inspectors, and will work in partnership with the care inspector to make sure they can be absolutely confident that what they find uh, can be reported and acted upon but also where they find good practice is that we take that away and learn from it so that we can make sure that every care home in the country is as safe as possible. Yeah. And it's important to, to point out right now that there are many, many care homes in our country, around half uh, of our care homes, who don't have cases of this virus. And part of the uh, objective is to keep it that way. But there are also many care homes who are... Uh, following very good practice and have kept the virus out and we need to share that as well as make sure that we are uh, responding to and addressing any issues of uh, concern that there might be and the care inspector is very focused on doing that. Uh, Lindsay Hanna from Bower. Thanks First Minister. This morning Professor Leach told listeners on Clyde 2 that one of the reasons that we're not being allowed to see family and friends is that he doesn't trust the whole population to behave appropriately. So does this then mean that the people who would behave responsibly are being punished because of those who aren't? And at what point will the Scottish Government be able to trust the population to behave appropriately? Um, I'll hand over to Jason Leach, who happens to be here, so can uh, speak for himself. But um, can I say, I, I do trust the Scottish population. Um, and I think the way in which the Scottish population has behaved thus far uh, suggests that they, uh, you, uh, are wanting to do the right thing and actually have done the right thing, which is why we're seeing things go in the right direction. All of our decisions right now are based on judgments about what is safe to do and, and what is required to do to keep the whole population safe and, and that is what will continue to guide us. In any country, on any issue, you'll always get a minority of uh, people and I think in this case it is a small minority of people, as the Chief Constable said when he was here last week, who, who flout the rules uh, and even some of those will not be doing it deliberately, they'll maybe have misunderstood what has been required but I do have huge trust and huge faith in the Scottish population uh, around this and I have to say from my own perspective that has built uh, and increased in recent weeks uh, rather than the reverse. Uh, but Jason is here. Uh, to speak for himself, so I I'll am, hand and over I'm, to him. I'm sure, Lindsay, you listened to the full hour on all of Bower's radio stations this morning. I, I do trust the population, and I think I have evidence for that trust. The, the trust is that the numbers have fallen. The population has behaved, as the guidelines said. What, what I was answering from you and this morning was a difference between individual health care and population health. So it was, a, it was a kind of tutorial in epidemiology. I won't repeat it here. But it was the difference between an individual taking an asthma inhaler to look after themselves and a population-based approach to save lives across a whole population. It's a very different form of healthcare. So we need the population to do things in order to save all of us rather than take a paracetamol to help with their own headache. It's a really important difference that the population in Scotland, I think, have, have understood in this new way of thinking about public health rather than individual health. So I do trust the population. However, we need to keep that going. We need to keep it going until we're very confident that the WHO's number one test for removing lockdown is done, and that is suppressing the virus. So if you were listening to Jason on the radio this morning, you would have an insight into my daily life, because I listen to his tutorials on epidemiology literally every uh, day, and, and I have to say they're very good. But we do trust the population. Um, and what we are doing, you know, I, I don't articulate this in the same way a clinician like Jason will do. But I've said repeatedly, and you'll have heard me saying it, what we're asking you to do right now is not just about protecting yourself. The actions we're all taking and the sacrifices we're all making, it's about protecting each other as well. And that is why I keep talking about these values. 
you know, every time you follow, every day you follow this guidance, you're putting these values of love and kindness and solidarity, care for your fellow human being into practice. And that's the point we're seeking to make. And, and to anybody who might think, you know what, I can just flout this guidance and nobody will notice. Think again about that because you're not just putting yourself at risk, you're putting other people at risk. So let's stick together and stick with this for a bit longer so that we can continue to have the effect that we are clearly having but need to see on an even more sustained basis. Uh, Tom Eden from PA. Thanks for asking, Stone. Good afternoon. Um, towards the end of April, you said that you'd update the public every week uh, with the number of deaths of NHS and care workers, um, but I don't think this has happened yet. Um, so can you tell us today how many have um, tragically lost their lives? And a quick yes or no question, if I may. Um, I know you've, tent as I know, you've sort of tentatively expressed support for this in the past, but yesterday the Welsh Government um, said it wouldn't give coronavi coronavirus bailouts or financial support to companies registered in tax havens. Will you commit today to doing the same? Um, we, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just, make, I'm just making sure I get the, the next uh, figure that I give you right because of the importance of it. Um, yeah, I, I want to make sure that when we are giving support to businesses, we're giving support to businesses, A, who need it, but also we're not giving support to businesses who don't, um, through their normal uh, adherence to paying tax and, and social responsibility, do the right thing. So that general principle uh, runs through uh, the support that we give. And I think people would expect that at this time. In my uh, experience of dealing with this uh, pandemic so far, the vast majority of businesses uh, have done the right thing and want to continue to do the right thing for their staff. But uh, that support, we, we're using, uh, whenever a government spends money, it's spending money that it raises through taxes, it's taxpayers' money, and it's really important right now that uh, businesses are being responsible and that taxpayers' money is not funding irresponsible behaviour uh, of, of businesses. So I would uh, endorse that in principle. Um, in terms of uh, the very important issue of health and social care uh, workers uh, who have sadly lost their lives, as at the, the 12th of May, so this is the uh, most up-to-date figure I'm able to give at this stage, we've been notified by health boards or by uh, the care inspector of, of seven deaths of health care workers and eight deaths of social care workers that are related to the virus. One really important point uh, to stress, though, is that we, we can't confirm how many of these staff actually contracted uh, the virus through their work. It may be that an individual was not even at work when they got it. So it's, it's people who, who work in these professions who have uh, sadly died, but it, it doesn't necessarily mean that they will have contracted the virus uh, at their work. So that's just an important uh, piece of context to understand and obviously my uh, condolences go to the families of each and every one of those. Uh, we update that figure every uh, Wednesday but I'll just uh, double check since you clearly haven't seen it that that has been uh, made available in the way that I believe it, it should be uh, being made available just now. Uh, thank you uh, for that. Can I now go to uh, Scott McNabb at The Scotsman? Thank you, uh, First Minister. Um, teaching unions have written to the government today on the um, proposed return to schools when it happens. They've criticised the cavalier approach down south and urged the government in Scotland uh, to commit to an, an August restart. Is that kind of timescale in line with current government strategy? Uh, well, these discussions are ongoing. Can I say... Um, there will be no cavalier approach to any aspect of this on the part of the Scottish Government for the reasons I set out before. This is far too important and there's too much at stake uh, for us not to make all of these judgments in as careful and considered a way as possible. There's lots of uncertainties. There's no absolute rights and wrongs in any of this, as you've heard me say before, but the greatest care and caution uh, is required in all of these decisions. The Deputy First Minister, who, as you know, is uh, also the Education Secretary, chairs an education recovery group, which has been uh, having discussions over the course of, of this week. I believe there are further discussions taking place later today to, to try to come to a consensus view on what is right and we'll set that out uh, when those decisions have been reached and I said earlier on we will seek to set out more information about the overall assessments we're making over the course of, of next week. Um, you know it is I think a reasonable thing for me to say right now bearing in mind that uh, these decisions haven't been taken 
in any final sense right now, that it is not going to be the case that schools are back to normal in any uh, way, shape or form this side of the summer holidays. Uh, we are, of course, discussing whether it is possible for any uh, pupils to be back in that time scale. Uh, but it, if, if it is, and we haven't concluded that yet, it is likely to be on a very limited basis. But it is those discussions that are underway on that very careful and considered basis. Uh, Kieran Andrews from The Times. Thank you, First Minister. Um, in guidance, in the Health Protection Scotland guidance, it tells care home workers who have tested positive to complete their shift if there are staff shortages um, that can't be covered in any other way. Is that an effective way of keeping staff and residents safe? Yeah, I'll hand over to Fiona uh, McQueen on the guidance. That's what the guidance says. There are, I've had conversations with my team about that. I have absolutely no doubt if anyone tests positive for COVID, they should not be in the front line caring for uh, residents. They should not be at their work. But think of it, if you're a registered nurse and you're on, in charge of that shift for 12 hours in a care home, uh, which may be 10 miles from anywhere, and you have a text or a telephone call to say you're, you're positive, then that nurse cannot just walk out of the care home. What I would expect them to do is go and isolate within a room until they have a relief coming to them. So there is never any intention in my mind that any member of staff who is COVID positive will be delivering care or at their work. There is going to be that transition time of, of, of being told and how do you then get relief um, from that. If at all possible, it would be immediate. And that's why the wraparound teams from the NHS systems are so incredibly important that I would expect a, a relief where one cannot be given immediately. Um, and clearly that's a part of the, the care home's preparedness and, and the way we would expect them to manage their staff. But if it cannot be immediate, then it would be as soon as possible and certainly uh, minutes rather than hours, but not delivering direct care well, at all. Why, Fiona spoke earlier on in response to a previous question about contingency planning. That is why contingency planning on care homes, on the part of care homes, is so important so that they have plans in place for these eventualities. But let me echo Fiona and be very clear here that we're talking in extremis for a very short period of time of a member of staff not simply walking out the door, but not, they would not be, if they had tested positive, be providing direct clinical care uh, to a resident. But the more contingency planning that care home providers do, uh, the uh, less uh, likely it will be for care homes to be in that situation. Uh, Libby Brooks from The Guardian. I've had my question answered already. Thanks for posting. Thank you very much, Libby. I appreciate that. Um, Tom Peterkin from the PNJ. Um, good afternoon, First Minister. In the wake of the sad news of the, the another death in um, uh, the, the home care the home farm care home in Sky. I, I wonder, are you confident enough has been done to prevent the spread of the virus into the community? And on a, on a slightly different matter, in England and Wales, there's data breaking down where care home residents end up um, losing their lives, whether in the in the home itself or in hospital. Um, in England and Wales, it, I think it's 72% died in their care homes. Do you have an equivalent figure for Scotland? And they're so what it is. And are you confident that care home residents are getting the treatment that they need? OK. Um, on the, the first part of the question, which I'll ask Fiona to say a bit about uh, as well, I am confident... When I say I'm confident, I don't want anybody ever on these issues to mistake that for complacency. We look at these things on a, a constant basis to make sure that we are satisfied that what needs to be done is being done and where there are issues that need to be addressed, they are addressed as, as quickly as possible. So, you know, it's not a case of saying we're confident and we don't continue to keep it under review. But I am confident at this stage that the, the health protection team uh, in NHS Highland uh, and what has been done in that care home, both within the care home and in terms of minimising spread uh, to the community, that these steps are being taken and we will continue to do 
everything possible to ensure that that is the case. Before I answer the uh, next part of your question, I'll ask if Fiona wants to say any more about that. So preventing transmission into the community is, is incredibly important and it's what people do in terms of the bread and butter, whether it's within health and social care. So when we've had the winter vomiting bug or when we've had flu, then the, the appropriate PPE and infection prevention and control measures within care homes are put in place and PPE and good infection prevention and control are at the forefront of preventing any transmission. So I would expect that to be done properly within a home. It's, it's in part why we're looking at testing, particularly in areas where the, the workers are asymptomatic and, and there is no COVID reported, as well as within the outbreaks. And we also have good resources for our, our health and social care staff through National Education Scotland and Health Protection Scotland in terms of how to put on and take off their PPE. So everything has been done to make sure our staff are as, as safe as they possibly can be, our residents are as safe as they possibly can be. And as a consequence of that, there would be minimal uh, transmission, if any, from the care home into the community. Do you want to say a bit about uh, admission to yes, hospital? Please. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. So, um, again, for the avoidance of doubt, all of our residents will get appropriate health and social care. Uh, care and where uh, someone needs admission to hospital, they would absolutely, that would be a conversation uh, with the GP. Our GPs are supporting our care homes um, very, very well, either uh, visiting in person or through remote, uh, near me, so, so video technology. And of course, the local GPs will know the care homes, they will know the residents, and where necessary, our residents of care homes would be admitted if it's appropriate, and if that's the right thing to do into a hospital. And where it's not, then the GP would make that decision about making sure that the resident in the care home is provided with the very, very best care they have within the care home. So just to complete that point and then uh, Jason may want to say a word or two as well the, the, the kind of care that somebody gets and, and where that care is delivered should be entirely based on their individual circumstances not whether they're in a care home versus their own home or based on the age of the person it should be down to what is the best clinical care for them um, as the interim chief medical officer said uh, recently at one of these briefings that it will sometimes not be the best decision for an older person to admit them to hospital and um, particularly if they're an older person already towards the end of their life perhaps with other uh, conditions the best thing may be to keep them where they are and a care home is an older person's home uh, rather than admit them to hospital but that is not a policy decision that is a decision that will be driven by clinical considerations and the best interests of the individual concerned on your point about statistics the national records of scotland statistics that are published every wednesday break down uh, deaths by whether somebody died in a care home or in a hospital or in another setting. Uh, what I will check is whether of those who died in hospital, there is a breakdown as to how many of them come from care homes. I'm not sure we can provide that statistic uh, at this stage, but we'll certainly, we, we want to obviously as, provide as much information as, as possible, but we'll come back uh, to you on that point. Uh, last point I would make is not really uh, the question you asked me, but it's, there's a lot of comparison at the moment between uh, care home deaths in Scotland versus the rest of the UK. I'm, I'm not, um, convinced at all that there is there will be a significant difference in that what I am uh, absolutely assured of is that in Scotland the figures we are uh, gathering and reporting are robust and comprehensive and I think that's really important and for example if in Scotland if you die of a stroke or if you die of dementia um, but at the time you have COVID even although it's not the direct cause of your death you will be included in the figures we publish for deaths, uh, COVID deaths. You, you will die uh, with it, even if, if you've died with it, even if you don't die from it. So that is a very expansive way of making sure that we are being robust in our reporting of these figures. I can't speak for figures in other parts of the UK, but I, I'm, I'm not sure that will be absolutely uh, the case. Uh, but it is the case in Scotland, and I think it's an important point uh, to stress. Uh, Jason, do you want to add anything on this? I think you've both covered it. In summary, patients and families, in consultation with clinical teams, get the best care they need in the location that is most appropriate for them. That may be at home, it may be in a care home, and it may be in a hospital. And we will appropriately transfer between those two elements, those three elements, as and when required. That will mean that some people will die in hospital having been in a care home, and it will mean some will die at home 
that that's the nature of clinical care. Thank you. Uh, Christine Lavelle from The Sun. Thanks, First Minister. Um, the latest figures from the Scottish Parliament's Information Centre show an average of 170 positive tests a day being recorded. Uh, that compares to 340 in mid-April. I just wondered how far down do these numbers have to get to before we can ease lockdown and test trace isolate teams can cope? And are we effectively stuck until we recruit and train enough contact tracers? No, we're not stuck uh, at all. And that's, that's just not the right way to look at it. We are being cautious about when we uh, lift things so that we don't see a rapid resurgence again. We think, and you know, you've heard me say this now for quite some time, that both in terms of, uh, or all in, in terms of cases, hospital admissions, ICU admissions, and now uh, we've now seen two weeks in a row of national records for Scotland statistics showing that the number of deaths from COVID is declining as well. So all of these trends are going in the right direction. We're not putting uh, firm numbers on where they need to get to, but there are judgments that need to be made about whether we suppressed it sufficiently uh, both to prevent a rapid resurgence when we start to ease things, but also, yes, to make sure that we can keep it under control uh, with not exclusively through Test Trace Isolate, but with that as a, a key measure. Test Trace Isolate will never work in isolation. It will require to, to work alongside continued social distancing. So I, I, I went into some detail yesterday about the, the, the all-important relationship between the R number and the incidence of cases, which is the number of new cases every day. Um, and it's the relationship between those two things that is most important. Uh, in short, as I said yesterday, you can uh, perhaps live a little more with a, an R number that is closer to one if you've got a very low incidence of cases. Right now, we are not sure that uh, we're not in a, still in a situation where the R number and the incidence of cases is still a bit too high. So we need to get uh, that down and be more confident that these reductions we're seeing are on a sustained basis. And it comes back to the point I made at the outset, and you've heard me make often before, it's not about being stuck. I want to move us back to normality as quickly as possible, but I'm not going to play a game of Russian roulette with people's lives here. Not taking, uh, well, there will always be an element of risk when we start to lift these restrictions. But I've got a judgment to make about how much risk we're prepared to take. And right now, my judgment is the risk is too great. And we need to see further evidence of a downward trend to give us confidence that we're not putting lives unnecessarily at risk when we start to ease these measures. And I'm, uh, I'm not going to apologise, given everything we're dealing with and what's at stake, for taking that cautious and considered approach. Uh, Rachel Watson from The Mail. Hi, First Minister, can I just go back on to the point that was made about the guidance for care home workers to kind of finish off a shift, even if their test comes back as positive? Um, firstly, are you concerned that families who see that guidance could be even more concerned about relatives that might be in care homes, that they could come into some kind of contact with someone who has the virus at their work? And secondly, at the beginning of the month, we were told there were 234 returners who had taken up social care posts with over 300 waiting to be deployed. Um, if there are concerns about staffing or contingency planning, can more of those be used to fill the gaps? Uh, yes, I mean, that's a key part of the contingency. So, you know, if, if you look at Sky uh, right now, there are NHS staff in there. So that is the reason to have that pool of workers that can step in and provide essential staffing in care homes where there are uh, people who have to be off work because they have tested positive or have symptoms of the virus. I, I don't want to go too much more over what we said previously, but let me stress, because I don't want people to uh, get the wrong uh, understanding here, we are not suggesting that a, a member of staff who has tested positive continues to come into contact with and give direct care to residents in a care home. Uh, but Families of residents also want to know a care home is, is safe and secure and there may just be, in some circumstances, a period of time where they will be not with uh, in direct contact with residents but still in the building so that there is a security of that care home. Um, that's what we are talking about and I think it's important people understand that this is not about taking uh, unacceptable risks with people who have the virus. And remembering that that member of staff will be feeling well. 
Anyone who has symptoms will not be at their work and will be at home. So, yes, I think it should be minutes and hours rather than, than hours for that person to be replaced. But they, they will be. Uh, and I'm thinking principally. I, I can think of uh, very few other practitioners within a care home setting who wouldn't be sent home right away uh, other than the registered nurse who is in charge of that home where that that's necessary not all homes need to have a registered nurse and we would get that replacement in very very quickly but remembering that person uh, will have been symptom free they will feel fit enough to report for duty themselves and they will be absolutely kept away until as a matter of urgency a replacement can be found guidance that is uh, published on any issue, often by its nature has to deal with the in extremist situations. These are not situations you want to have arising, but you have to give guidance for what happens in the unusual situations as well as the more usual situations. Uh, but you know, let us be very clear here. If somebody has tested positive for the virus, they will not be providing direct clinical care. This is about making sure that a care home is not left even for a short period of time without the right level uh, of cover, uh, because that would also pose a danger to residents in the care home. So this is, uh, it's very important that the context uh, and the parameters of this is understood. Uh, Daniel Sanderson from The Telegraph. Um, thank you very much, First Minister. Um, today, Scotland's universities are warning that they face a truly dire situation in terms of their finances because of coronavirus. And according to University Scotland, principals will explore territory that was previously unthinkable to cut, co to cut costs. Um, and Karen Watt of the Scottish Funding Council, who was at the Education Committee this morning, also appeared to say that a new model of funding would be needed um, going forward. So I just wondered, are you prepared to explore territory that was previously unthinkable to save Scotland's universities? And um, could that mean introducing some form of fees for Scottish students? Um, I'm not considering introducing fees uh, for Scottish students. I think my uh, views on the importance of uh, access to education being based on uh, your ability to learn, not your ability to pay, is, is really important. And I think it's a, a principle that coming out of a crisis, I would uh, want to, to work hard to protect. But we are also uh, working very closely with universities and will continue to do so. Uh, universities and they're not alone in this predicament. So many different areas of our economy and society are finding uh, the, the impact of this virus extremely hard. But universities are being uh, very significantly uh, hit um, with a, a very big financial implication. We have already uh, given some immediate additional funding to universities, the uh, £75 million uh, increase in funding uh, for uh, research to help them protect uh, what they're doing right now. We will continue uh, to have close discussions with universities about what uh, is required in the future. Of course, they will be expected to use their own assets and to adapt and to try as, as all businesses, uh, not just uh, in the education sector, but as all businesses generally will have to do to help get through uh, this crisis. But the, the Scottish Government through the Funding Council will continue to work closely with universities and offer uh, as much support as we can. Our universities are you know, critical to our success as a country. Uh, in terms of the provision of education, but the world leading research where our universities globally punch above their weight. And, and also in terms of Scotland's international reputation, the importance of our universities is hard to overstate. So uh, there will be a, a very close dialogue between the Scottish Government and our university sector about how we together navigate our way through this difficult situation. Uh, lastly, I would uh, hope that we will also see the UK government uh, take some action here. Uh, they haven't to any great extent yet, but that will be a discussion that we continue to have with them as well. Uh, David Ball from The Herald. Uh, thank you, First Minister. <clears throat> um, with the majority of integration joint boards facing big budget deficits before the pandemic emerged, uh, many now warning that emergency measures will be needed on top of this, how confident are you that health boards will have enough funding to provide sort of day-to-day -day services as we emerge from the pandemic? Uh, look, the financial implications of this virus are, uh, as we've just been talking about with the universities, are, are going to be felt in almost every area of our lives. Um, but we have a, a duty and a responsibility to manage uh, this and to protect uh, what matters most. And 
Uh, as we found out uh, over this pandemic, we knew it anyway, but it's been reinforced. There's a few things that matter more than health and caring for the health of the population. So we will work with health boards, we'll work with IGBs. We've been uh, very clear with uh, health boards and with local authorities that financial constraints should not be affecting uh, how we deal with this crisis right now. Uh, and as we go into a recovery phase, as we start to resume more routine uh, health care, then these discussions will continue so that we can ensure that we have the capacity and the ability to deal with this uh, virus, which we were going to have to continue to do for quite some time to come, but also the day-to-day -day health needs of people across the country as well. None of these uh, issues are going to be straightforward or easy for any government anywhere in the world to deal with, but we have a good foundation here in Scotland and we'll continue to make sure that we work in a, a responsible way that is about protecting uh, the things that matter most to us. And the last question today is uh, from Tom Magner from Carers World Radio. No, sorry, I am being told uh, Tom hasn't been able to join us today. So um, can I thank all the journalists who did join us? Uh, my uh, thanks to Jason and to Fiona for uh, joining me here today. Uh, my grateful thanks as always to Rachel, our uh, sign language interpreter, for helping us make sure that this uh, is an accessible update for everybody across the country. And my thanks again to you. Thank you for joining us, but thank you for continuing to do what is necessary to help us deal with this virus. Um, as I said earlier on, I know that as we go into another weekend, it becomes that much harder to continue to stay at home and do all the right things, but it is necessary and it is making a difference. So my grateful thanks to all of you. Please, please keep doing it. I don't want to be standing up here a week or two weeks from now telling you that we've slipped back and gone in the wrong direction and that these measures are having to stay in place for longer. Every uh, day right now that we stick to these rules, we don't just save lives but we will be doing that. We also bring forward the time when we can get that normality back. So uh, I know these are unusual circumstances. They may be starting to feel a bit more usual uh, after eight weeks, uh, but they are unusual circumstances. So within that context, please have as good a weekend as you are able to. Uh, the Health Secretary will be here on Sunday to lead the weekend briefing, and I'll be back here with you at the usual time of 12.30 on Monday. Uh, thank you all very much.